My name is Kwaro Obuku. I'm a medical officer and a member of the Uganda Medical Association. Yes, in terms of the country, definitely we have now entered in a stage where the epidemic has spread in the community, meaning that uh, the burden is such that we can no longer trace its source. And as you can see, the numbers have increased exponentially. Uh, just yesterday, I think we recorded over 150 cases. And uh, the deaths have also now crossed 60, which is still low compared to malaria, which kills about 13 a day. Okay? Uh, this has killed uh, 60 over a period of weeks. So that's where we are as a country. What is the challenge? We are now in community spread. Meaning even up to 10% of the population can catch COVID. We are talking about 4-5 million. Are you going to bring 4-5 million into health facilities? Impossible. We don't have the resources. Even if we had, is that the best spend of our money? What do you want to do? According to data, so decision should be data driven. According to data, we know from the initial Chinese cohorts that up to 80% people are symptomatic. So COVID positive should not be medicalized, bring you to the medical and so on. COVID positive, like HIV positive, you can live positively with HIV, you can live positively with COVID. It's not a death sentence. Okay? Med be made aware, wear your mask, where possible, self-isolate at home with a principal caretaker, a communication channel, and a referral system. This is where now our Uganda National Ambulance Systems comes in. Yeah, 999, instead of coming for patrol, they come for your body and take you, if you are deteriorating. Meaning a, 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 a facility which is accessible with oxygen. Oxygen has been shown to be more important than ICU in COVID-19. Why? By the time you reach ICU, man, you cannot repair that body. So let's prevent it by doing oxygen therapy and by doing screening of the oxygen in the blood. Early. Actually, screening of oxygen or oximetry, pulse oximetry, that, that device may be more effective and an investment better than this temperature gun. Because by the time someone, sometimes you find the, the lungs are shutting down, we don't know about it. This is what science has, has showed us. So we can use that device in peripheral facilities to screen people. I'm not sure the utility in the banks, where if you should screen people in the banks and public spaces using pulse oximetry. But that's something that we should think about. Then those who are sick, we take them to Mulago and so on. Those who are asymptomatic but at high risk, we could also consider monitoring them closely. Those who have blood pressure, those who are much older, okay? Those who have other ongoing conditions which have been shown to increase uh, risk of uh, uh, unfavorable outcomes. That is death and complications of multiple organ failure. So getting to the point of mm. uh, Uganda and its COVID fight, mm. at the moment, do you think we are having some misplaced priorities? Do you think as a, as a medic? You know, because you've given a comparison of graduation of policemen or LDUs, I don't know. Then our medical students who might be very, actually I would say they are very critical in this moment, are at home. And some of them are actually expecting to graduate uh, in the course of this year. Yeah, there are two, uh, there are, there are actually there are three categories mm. of so-called medical students. Yes. They are the postgraduates who are doing masters of medicine, who have completed their degrees, mm. they are certified doctors mm. and can practice. They have come back to specialize into, say, women studies or obstetrics, mm -hmm. or children studies or pediatrics, then surgery, operation, yes. and so on and so forth, ENT and so on. I, you know. Yes. So these ones, there is no need to send them home. And the good thing, they have not been sent home. Mm -hmm. They need to continue with their academics and graduate because they're in studies, but our kind of studies is actually work. Then there's the so called intern doctors yes. who are coming out to the field. You know, our work is learned on human bodies, yes. not on computers. Mm -hmm. And in the real world setting, we must be able to handle this COVID-19 situation. So what we need to do is to guarantee their safety yes. and invest in that mm -hmm. through training, through bigger numbers so that if they work for shorter times, yes. but also through giving them equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, face masks and so on and suits. Yes. The then the third category are the undergraduates who, uh, of course, 
uh, like any other students. You know, they do classes and so on. But there are those in clinical years, the year five and other years. Eh? Those could also be permitted to continue with their studies, especially in low risk areas, okay. which can be designated in hospitals where patients are selected, they are tested, they are negative, and they can be used mm -hmm. as, uh, as patients who can help in clinical studies. Mm -hmm. You get what I mean? Yes. So that you go to a ward and you know with these 10 patients are COVID negative and the students are free to come in there mm -hmm. and attend to them for purposes of learning. Okay. And maybe we can say medical students and undergraduates should not go to the outpatients where there is Kayola. Anybody is coming in, you don't know they are coughing, whether they have COVID or not. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So lastly, it's about the opening of the borders. Mm. It has, of course, there are very many people expecting the president to open the borders tomorrow mm. uh, when he makes this, uh, mm. when he addresses the nation. But there are those ones also think it's not it's not the right time to open the borders because we see like in Europe the cases are again rising. Mm. Of course, definitely those people are bored. Some of them want to come directly to mm. Uganda and some of these countries. So what do you think about the issue of opening Let us open. And how do we do it effectively? You know, we have reached a stage where now, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm -hmm. This is what the Wazungu say. Yes. I don't know what, how I can put it in the African sense, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But... We are this critical phase where there is almost no difference, whatever you do. Yes. There is community spread. We don't seem to be able to contain it anymore, so we've got to live with it. Mm -hmm. The SOPs mm. of coming into Uganda are clear. Yes. Negative tests come in. If you don't have a test, you will be tested at your cost. Yes. Very clear. Mm. If you are positive, quarantine. If you are negative, you will be followed up. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that is also an extra cost. You know, this uh, contact tracing can also be costly. Yeah. But I think we can use technology to make it cheap. Not the, you know, initially when the pandemic was starting, we follow you physically, pick you and so on, your contacts, mm -hmm. very expensive venture. Mm -hmm. Okay, for a disease which, when we look at perspective, we yes. put it into perspective. Malaria is still the leading killer. HIV, TB and so on, they are still over and above COVID-19. So we need to put that perspective when we are doing investment. So they should come in with COVID negative test and continue about their own business. Because yes. they are coming into a community anyway, yes. which is having community spread and higher risk. That's true. Yeah. Uh, some of these public health interventions depend on the stage of the epidemic, but also the resources available. In Uganda, we are a relatively low income country. Our resources are not infinite. We cannot just print money, otherwise that will ruin the economy. We do not have sufficient number of healthcare professionals. The hospital beds are limited. And therefore, our approach must take into consideration this context. I wouldn't give lots of resources to contact tracing when people are beginning to die. I would not give resources to contact tracing when we are beginning to see clinical cases go up and doctors are just not enough, ICU beds are not enough. So I think we need to be judicious in where we invest the money. Probably testing would be a more reasonable uh, investment than contact tracing, active contact tracing. We can do what we call passive contact tracing, where the person can maybe uh, link up with their contacts and encourage them to test, you know, through messaging, public messaging that if you know uh, uh, you have a person who is positive, then you can present yourself passive. Other than uh, the challenge with active is that it's costly, and we do not have that luxury. Remember those days uh, when you a contact, they even transport you. But as the reality came to, uh, to to the cost, then now you transport yourself. They started by, I think, paying a uh, quarantine fees. Then of course we are going to pay billions in hotel money. Now they said, okay, pay for yourself. They started by giving out free tests to anybody, including contacts. Now they are saying you pay 200,000 and above, isn't it? So I think the realization is coming to fruition that this intervention can be very costly. And COVID interventions are, have the capacity to crowd out the attention given to other ongoing killers. Maternal deaths, three per day according to those who die in the facility in the Ministry of Health report, okay? We estimate 16, but three per day. Pneumonia, about seven per day, okay? A, a anemia, about six per day, die. Then, of course, malaria is the biggest killer, which killed 4,501 last year. If the president is to announce the number of those who have died 
from malaria as he used to announce those who have been infected with COVID-19. That presidential address will go on for a week without conclusion, meaning that the attention should not be taken away from the non-COVID diseases.